Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess we can just jump right into it. Uh, uh, this talk is about scaling version control systems, and if you're in here, you're probably in the right place. A um, little bit about me. My name is Ben Caro. I'm the sysadmin, the primary sysadmin uh, for Mozilla, primarily dealing with version control systems. Um, I interact with a lot with the release engineering team, and this is a really old picture of me. Um, and uh, so what's this talk about, basically? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. Um, it's about version control systems, but uh, it's, it's about scaling version control systems, and it's about some of the stories uh, and some of the examples uh, from trying to do that. Um, so it, uh, it's primarily dealing with Mercurial. That's the main system that we use at Mozilla. Um, we use a lot of others, but uh, and I'm going to talk about more than Mercurial this session, but that's basically it. And as you could guess, there's probably some Heisenberg-related activity here. Um, so there's headaches and Heisenbugs, and uh, there's getting kicked off of GitHub for excessive, <laughs> for, uh, excessive usage, um, which I didn't know could happen, but apparently it can. Um, so a little bit of background on this. Um, uh, we'll start with some statistics. Like I said, we primarily use Mercurial, although uh, Firefox OS uses uh, GitHub a lot for development. Um, let me see. We have a couple thousand repositories, many of which are unique. Um, and likewise, we have a lot of commits, but a lot of them are only about one in uh, a thousand are uh, unique. So, um, well, one million in 32 million, I guess. Um, and that leads to a lot of more interesting problems, uh, which I can get to in a bit. Uh, we do about two terabytes of transfer a day from these systems, um, which ends up being a thousand clones. Um, and it's actually a lot more than this if you consider all the smaller repositories that uh, we're serving. These are a thousand fresh clones a day versus several thousand updates and refreshes and things like that. Uh, we're our own biggest customer. Uh, the release engineering department is uh, responsible for what would now be called continuous integration on all of the systems. And we test on over 12 platforms. So several different versions of Windows, uh, recent and legacy versions of OS X, uh, different architectures on Linux, etc. cetera. Uh, we also use these things. Um, we use Git quite extensively as well, especially for mirroring a lot of our Firefox OS stuff because GitHub doesn't necessarily have the best uptime. Um, the others we host, but we don't particularly use them extensively and haven't really had to uh, deal with scaling problems of them. Uh, interestingly, we still have the same RCS repository that's backing the mail aliases file from when we were Netscape. That file just hasn't changed in decades. <laughs> um, Bazaar still uses, or Bugzilla still uses Bazaar, but uh, they're migrating over to Git, and uh, our update system still uses CVS, although we're trying to kill a lot of these with fire. Um, so next up, this is basically as complicated as this gonna, that I'm going to detail for Mercurial, but there's two SSH servers, and there's 10 hosts that mirror HTTP traffic. Um, Unpictured is a load balancer that actually balances all the incoming traffic and strips off the SSL going to these hosts. And uh, also Unpictured is the NFS server that acts as the backend data store for, uh, for the SSH servers. Uh, recently, we moved the, uh, the web mirrors to local disk, and that's created a pretty big performance improvement and... Uh, greater availability since we're not just running all of these on uh, identical hosts. All right, so you're saying get to the story. Um, so the first story is about knowing what you're hosting and the perils of what can happen if you don't. So I was just sitting there, as you usually do, at your best red operator control center, snooping on emails. I don't actually snoop on emails and deleting user files. And I was minding my own business, and this bug comes in. And this bug says, I used to host this repo on GitHub, but they disabled it since Saturday. And I need to host it somewhere. It's sort of big, but I made a bundle out of it, which is 1.7 gigs. Can you just host this for me? And I was thinking, now, why would GitHub kick something off that's 1.7 gigs? I've never personally tried to host something that big there, but maybe they're just trying to crack down on resource usage. Um, this should have been my first warning. Um, so I go look at the page, and sure enough, I hadn't seen this before, but... Uh, and this is still up there. Uh, it basically says you use too many resources and we aren't going to host your repository anymore. And the funny thing is, I talked to the developer afterwards and he can't actually delete this. So this is just a cone of shame that he has to wear on his GitHub account for the rest of its existence. Um, so 
I do it, and I'm thinking maybe I'll just defer it for a while. And then he responds to the bug, I think that Bcare is the person who set up git.mozilla.org, so fine, I guess I have to do it, I'm being called out. Maybe I'll put it off till next week. But no, I should mention that this is repos being used to maintain our Git mirror, so this is pretty important. Now, this is before and quite possibly the reason why I understood the difference between importance and urgency. Um, so, conflating the two, I did it right away. I looked at the host and I said, wow, this really isn't loaded at all. There's like a load average of 0 0.5, there's a couple HTTP processes. There's 24 cores here with 60 gigs of RAM. This should be no problem for yet another repository that just one user is going to use. So I said, all right, here's your repository. Uh, here's some details. You can upload your code. Let me know if you have any issues with it. So I dusted my hands off, and I went away, and I thought this was done. I'd never hear from him again, another happy customer, uh, until this happened. And this happened um, on the the very, very morning of uh, April 22nd, which I think is a Saturday, but this guy is kind of crazy, and he's European, and he's working in a European time schedule. So this happened when everybody else was sleeping. Um, and so we didn't really know what was going on. Nagio started reporting that uh, there were critical levels of swap used. Um, there were availability problems with the host. It was basically bringing the whole thing down. Um, and this would happen, and then maybe 45 minutes later, it would just finish whatever it was doing and then go back to being a normal host. So I SSH in, and I DU the repository, and I see that it is not the 1.7 gigs promised, but 208 gigs used. Um, so I, I do a little more looking. I do git log, and I see this kind of thing. And what this tells me is that this is kind of a, an automated repository that he's using, and he's mirroring a lot of the Mercurial commits in it. And this was the first attempt that we had to do a multi-master setup between Mercurial and Git. So he's taking a lot of these huge uh, Mercurial chain sets and moving them over to Git. And the problem is, is that these, uh, these pushes had objects that were about 122 megs apiece. And it was doing multiple at a time. Um, and then, so that's fine, as long as they're not too often, but they are kind of often. They're happening every 30 seconds or sometimes a minute. And so you can kind of see what's going on here. So this is basically what it was doing with the server. Um, I don't have an HTOP interface to show you, but uh, it was basically like this. Um, <laughs> I, I <laughs> The meme can be in the notes. Uh, the funny thing, it wasn't, uh, the host wasn't very responsive, but, uh, and you couldn't actually get an interpreter, but you could SSH in and issue a command, and that still had uh, priority to run which involves some really conflict, like really weird debugging processes. So I disabled the repo, I set it read-only, and then I started hunting for options that I could, uh, I could use to fix this. Now, coming from a past of being a Gen 2 racer, I'm used to reading nice, thick man pages looking for tuning options. Still, this one was particularly dense. Uh, the, only the git config man page itself is 2,601 lines, and I didn't really know what I was looking for. I knew it had to do something with garbage collection or packing files, but I didn't really know what. Uh, additionally, this was happening on a live system, so if I mistune this, I could just send the box deeper into, deeper into problems. And this is when uh, Git was just running on one host at Mozilla, so we really needed this host to be up. Um, so I started hunting, and I found some things. Um, I found this, which was the uh, pack window memory operation. And this is uh, kind of useful. It's uh, pretty cool, but the problem is, is there's no limit on it. It defaults to zero, meaning that can eat, it can eat as much RAM as it can possibly use for this pack operation. And uh, so this is something that if we're going to have uh, commits, uh, pushes every 30 seconds, this is probably something we should set so we don't out of memory the box like we were doing before. Um, additionally, there was this option, which was the... Uh, garbage collection uh, when it runs. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that uh, it was defaulting to 6700. Uh, setting it to zero disables it, which is good for performance, but it's terrible for disk usage, and eventually will be bad for performance when you have to grab all these individual objects. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that it determines when to run the, uh, the garbage collection whenever you issue a bunch of weird various commands. Like you can issue a garbage collection if you're just trying to do git status on a repository, which is um, unexpected, at least from me. 
Um, so we set this down from 6,700 to 1,000, um, and then we rsynced the repository to a spare host so it wouldn't affect availability, and we told it to uh, do a manual pack and garbage collection, and then we waited, and we waited some more. And then 18 hours later, it was done. And we looked, and it was much better. It was 28 gigs. So the pack operations had an effect. Um, it's important to note here that if your repository is just one big pack file, that also has a lot of performance implications. Fortunately, they're not on the server, so it's not our problem anymore. Um, but uh, it can increase uh, clone time for uh, people who are trying to grab it. Um, fortunately, it didn't appear for us after this. And so if we looked at the load graph, we had this problem. And then ever since then, uh, we haven't run into any uh, hardcore availability problems with it anymore. So few. Um, there were more, no more load spikes. Um, I mean, there were issues because Git and uh, particularly Gitalite that we're using for this aren't perfect. But at least we didn't run into any problems like this anymore. So. That's the first story of this. Um, so what else you got? Um, so my next story, uh, I have to go back a little bit into Mozilla's history. And this begins in, uh, uh, you'll see what I mean in a bit, but uh, I have to go into history of managed uh, code and CI at Mozilla. So the year is 2003. Uh, GitHub won't be invented for another four years. Just the idea of uh, continuous integration was invented in 1998, and I think there was only one piece of software out there that you could use for it, and it was called Cruise Control or something like that. Um, but developers still exist, and we had a lot of them, and they needed some way to be able to check their code in and have operations performed on it and run testing, because uh, with a small project, you can only have a couple developers and it works fine, but when you're trying to manage 100 developers and the code that's coming in from them and making sure they don't collaborate each other's changes, it's a particularly difficult problem to solve, especially with the software available in 2003. So we had a CI system like this. Um, we learned about the new hotness. We did not have a light like this, which is kind of cool, but uh, this is GitHub's light, and it's a pretty common project to do uh, if you're at a software org that uses continuous integration. Um, if you go grab my slides and click the link, this is to their build. Uh, this, that's a link to the blog post documenting their build. Um, the way it works is a typical kind of CI workflow. Uh, developers write code, they generate patches, these all get bundled in mercurial change sets, and then those get bundled into change groups, and then you push them off to a server, and then, uh, and then it builds it for you. Uh, this is Weirdly enough, there's a Wikipedia page for these build light indicators. I don't particularly think they need them, and apparently neither does Wikipedia, but uh, I found it interesting that it was there. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is why we called it Try. Uh, this was a system for developers to uh, host their code and then push it out to a server, and they don't have to introduce it into the main repository and then potentially break everything in the world. Um, and then it gets pushed, and then it runs on something like this when a developer is not playing X-Plane on it. Um, there's prob there probably be sh should be some Macs in there because we do a lot of uh, testing on Macs as well, which is another particular source of difficulty for us. So our developer checks some code in, and then it either comes back negative or it becomes positive, and then it's all good, man. Um, they go to a site later, they look at their build status, and everything is fun. Um, the problem comes uh, from the server side of this. And its uh, particular detail is about one of the Mercurial implementation details. It's about changes being immutable. For the first probably eight years of the Mercurial project, they decided that immutable history was a fantastic idea. And it meant that nobody could ever screw around with a repository and you would have to deal with the consequences, the consequences of it as an end user. Um, and this has a lot of uh, advantages like that. Unfortunately, scalability is not one of these advantages. So in Mercurial 2.1, they, they introduced this feature called phases. And if something is not in the public phase, if it's in the draft or private phase, you can delete it and not worry about people downstream of you uh, being grumpy at you that you perform some kind of interactive rebase or some uh, history deleting rebase and uh, basically mangled their entire repository. Unfortunately, uh, at Mozilla, we had a lot of difficulty upgrading this, uh, simply because our conti continuous integration environment uses so many different platforms that trying to debug a new version of Mercurial on Windows and Windows on ARM and OS X and Linux and dealing with case insensitivity was really difficult. So we were stuck on a version that didn't include this feature uh, for a very long time. Um, 
So when a, a developer uh, creates new changes for this, uh, they push it out uh, to the try repository. They create what's called a mercurial head. And that is uh, the equivalent of a Git branch. Uh, but well, for this talk, it's equivalent. There are some technical differences, like they don't have to have the same root node. But for this, they don't matter. Um, uh, but as you might expect, um, the people who originally created this system never really gave thought on how to clean this up. That's IT's problem. So you end up with something like this. Uh, this is a try repository after a little while, and it has the equivalent of 29,000 branches on it. Um, so I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that this is an expected use case for version control systems. And it's, I, I don't know if it's an acceptable use case from, uh, from the upstream project either. At first, uh, when we told them about this, they didn't think it was an acceptable use case. But uh, I don't know. I think they took it as a personal challenge that they should try to improve this and support, support this. So now it's kind of uh, becoming accepted. So the way we arrived at this number is basically uh, we have 100 developers, which was true uh, in the mid-2000s, and let's say 30 of them push four times a day, or four times a week. Uh, and those people are pretty hardcore. They're pushing quite often to see the results of their changes, and there's 70 that are pushing twice a week. If we sum these up, that's 260 a week, which is about 1,000 a month, which is about 12,000 a year. Now, the problem comes at 10,000 uh, 10, heads, and then the problem looks like this. At around 10,000 heads, some of the operations just start to fail. Um, now, it's interesting because most of these heads uh, have no more operations that happen on them. They just are pushed to once, and then they're left idle. Uh, they get checked out once, and then afterwards, they don't do anything unless someone's doing some code archaeology on them. So they have some problems, but not others. Um, back when we had the web hosts and SSH hosts running on the same machines, or when they were the same machines, they had availability problems for developers to push to, and they couldn't load the pages to go pull the code either. Um, when we separated those out, only the push problems remained, but the, the mirrors that are using the local disks on the separate hosts don't have any problem serving this up anymore, so we have defeated the problem with this. Um, the problem was that Pushing would take so long, and it would upset so many developers and basically give them... Uh, they weren't very confident in the system that we had to actually create some documentation for them, which looked like this. Um, this was an entry, and it still is an entry in the wiki page that I've blurred out a little bit because I'm going to explain it later. And it says, if you experience excessive wait times exceeding 45 minutes, please file a bug to IT. And I don't know about you, but 45 minutes is slightly excessive just trying to do a push operation. Um, but this happened so infrequently, it only happened once a year, that it was never saw fit to put forth the engineering effort to try to solve this. Whenever it happened, we would just, uh, IT would just go manually in and fix it. But because this happened once a year, they poked IT, and IT became a grumpy bear, because no one around really remembered how to do this, so they'd have to go look up documentation. And then it caused release engineering to be a grumpy bear, too, because they had to go cancel all the build jobs that were trying to go check out code that wasn't there anymore. And it, it made developers grumpy, too, because they had to keep their changes around and push them again, just because we deleted it last time they tried to do it. Um, and so this is basically how it worked for several years at Mozilla. But the problem was is that uh, the, the code grew over time. So this is a graph of the source lines of code in the, Firefo in the Mozilla Central project, which is a Firefox browser and Thunderbird uh, webmail or email client. And from about 2012, uh, when this was uh, true, to about now, the code doubled in size, from about 6 million to about 12 and a half million. So the symptoms of what this kind of looks like um, is that developers have problems when they're pushing to uh, 10,000 heads. Um, the symptoms are 45 minutes to return. Sometimes they never return. Um, some more details are that the, uh, um, when you SSH into the server and look around, there's one HD serve process running. Uh, it has one core pegged, um, and it's just using CPU. There's no strace output, so you can't really see what it's doing. There's no ltrace output, so it's not making any syscalls or library calls. Uh, killing it yields no nice traceback that you could use to figure out where it was. And if it killed... If it's killed, the exact same thing is going to happen on, a subs on most subsequent runs. Sometimes it didn't, but we're not quite sure why that, uh, why that was. So this is kind of a Heisen bug. Um, we didn't, it kind of defied scrutiny. We wanted to get to the bottom of it and solve this problem, so we needed to try harder. 
So what we did was uh, we had to compile some packages. These are painfully RHEL 6 hosts, so we had to have uh, this debug info package, which conveniently was not provided to us. Um, we need to have G GDB installed, and I wrote a nice little GDB script that we could use to dump the stack trace from it. GDB script looked like this. It attached to a process. It ran the BT, which just gave us a system backtrace. It ran the PyBT command to give us a Python backtrace. And then it attached from the process and quit. And this mostly worked. And this is what the output looked like. You could ignore the first two lines. Those are just uh, um, system things that say it is running inside the Python interpreter. It's doing some compares on it. But if you look down below, um, you can see the uh, ancestor line here. And it's uh, performing some iteration options in there. It's using that iter, iter generator. Um, and it's happening inside the, the branch map uh, uh, function, and it's trying to update cache. So we eventually figured out that what it's trying to do is uh, it's trying to update the cache. Um, let me see. Yeah. And with 10,000 heads, this is not very scalable at all. So now it can go unblur that little section of the wiki, and it says that uh, if, a developer, if a fellow developer has canceled their push, as in control c it, then they've just saddled you with the cost of rebuilding the cache. Um, so what was happening was that uh, if a developer control c would it was invalidating the entire cache for the repository, and on the next subsequent run, it had to generate that from scratch each time. When you have really huge repositories like this, that can take upwards of 45 minutes. So then we asked ourselves, why is it updating the cache? And it turned out to be a, or why is it invalidating the entire thing? And it turned out to be a Mercurial bug. So we put this bug in with Mercurial uh, back in May, and we've been working with them to try to fix this. Uh, it's confirmed status. Uh, so we're still trying to whittle this down to a very good example case. Um, so what do we do after, because we can't fix this, or we're, we're in the process of fixing this? Um, we filed our upstream bug, and that's good. Um, we switched to a better compression format. This general delta format uh, was introduced in Mercurial 1.9, and it provides about a 10x increase in, uh, in speed and compression for some of the operations that it's doing, like storing metadata. Um, we have to find some ways to change the caching behavior. And the way this has worked now is that we have some extensions that we're using on top of it uh, to be able to manually control this caching behavior. And that's worked very well for us. And then we wanted to plan a new and more scalable system. Um, since this was good, but this was the solution for Mozilla in the 2000s and not the mid-2010s. Um, so what we've essentially done is added some duct tape to, uh, to our wheel. Yeah? <laughs> So you had that bug for 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> it was a very long-standing bug. Um, and it didn't actually uh, crop up for us. It would crop up about once a year, and then we would hit it in the head, and no one really thought about it very much because they didn't think it was worth the engineering effort to fix. And now that we have more than 100 developers, we're hitting this bug every couple months. So it's actually worth our time to go bother and, and fix it and create a more permanent solution, which is what we're doing now. Um, so instead of duct taping our... our lunar rover and getting coaxing more life out of it, uh, we can go and create something that is more uh, analogous to what's used today. Um, so this is a new hotness. We're going to use it to replace the old system. Um, it needs more web scales, preferably with some MongoDB. Um, I'm not actually going to use MongoDB for this. Um, it's going to use something closer to a pull request model. Uh, Mozilla was avoiding this for a very long time, um, but uh, we're basically creating this homemade solution with review board and a couple other tools because we wanted to integrate with Bugzilla and be multi uh, version control system compliant and then have multi master with Git and Mercurial for the repositories. Uh, we want it because we can do easier multi homing for more disaster recovery. NFS shares aren't particularly known for working very well across data center which is something we want to avoid of. Um, this is going to leverage Mercurial bundles, which are analogous, analogous to Git bundles. So instead of a developer taking their changes and then pushing it to a remote repository and it living live in that repository, um, we've created a custom server that takes their bundles and then uh, pretends to be a server and says, all right, cool, I got it, dude. And then it goes and shoves it into an object store. And then we can reference that later and trigger build jobs off of it. And then it can live there forever um, because this is a purpose-built object store for storing things like this. Um, 
And ideally, this should require minimal tooling from other groups. There's a lot of uh, legacy platform code because we do a bunch of testing on like Windows 7 and Windows 7 Pro and Windows RT with ARM and some smaller platforms. Like I think we're still building on MAMO stuff. Um, so we don't want to have to go change a lot of this code to get it to work there. So this is something that's really important to us as well and is part of the reason why it's so slow going. Um, so in review, know what you're hosting um, and ask questions until you're certain that you uh, know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Don't host everything together if you can help it because oftentimes your developer can give you something and if you try to host it on the same server as production code and his thing has a problem that affects the host, then you have problems affecting your production hosts as well and nobody likes that. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, don't assume the approach you're going to use is going to work forever. Um, like this approach that we had with the tri-server, it worked for the better part of a decade, but the it had some problems that started becoming more aggravating over time, and over time we had to replace it. And uh, now is about that time, and it's <laughs> run a little long, to be honest. Um, and then the last one is you don't live in a vacuum. Uh, the Mercurial community has been really helpful for us, and they... Uh, they're really communicative on IRC and on mailing lists, so you can just join the channel and say, hey, I have a problem, and give them a paste bin or something like that, or describe it, and they'll actually work with you on it. And uh, oftentimes that can be so far as to go through stack traces with you and tell you to add breakpoints or tell you to actually profile it and then do this interactively with you. Um, and particularly in the Mercurial community, there's a lot of other users that are trying to scale this out, like Facebook and Google are also trying to do this. Um, and they're creating, they have a lot more engin engineering resources than we do, so they're actually uh, working with the code itself and uh, creating a lot of speed-ups due to faster operations and things like that. Um, so for some further reading, uh, if you're interested in these sorts of things, you can check out the uh, Planet Release Engineering blog at Mozilla. Uh, it's a blog planet. Um, it has a bunch of different... Uh, bunch of different topics. There's maybe 25 people uh, working and maybe 20 contribute to this blog and there's posts every couple days. This one is the latest and it was only five or uh, six days ago now. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that happens there. Uh, um, the other, one other person on my team, Greg Zork, uh, he writes about this uh, fervently. Um, his main... His big thing is developer productivity, so he tries to streamline the whole process. We had a blog post pretty recently about um, what the difficulty and the pain points that developers go through every time they want to contribute to a project, which is something a lot of us don't think about. Things like you need to have an account here, and you need to have an account here, and you need to have checkout code here, and what's SSH, and things like that. And it's a lot of stuff that, as developers, we don't think about, but if we're trying to attract new, new, uh, new people to contribute to these projects, then it's something that I think we do have to think about. Um, lastly, I have a blog up at bke.ro. Um, I write about some things. Uh, sometimes a lot of it's personal, though. Um, so if you're interested, uh, check these things out. Um, this is me. Uh, the slides are up here. Um, yeah, feel free to get a hold of me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We actually have quite a bit of time for questions, so feel free to ask anything that comes to mind. If anything does come to mind. <laughs> This might not be something you've had much involvement with, but um, how, are you, have you actually found that some of the tools coming out of the Mozilla Services Group um, help with all of this process? Like, um, I know that, uh, in particular, Hecker has been a huge improvement in the performance and general yeah. overhead and room to play on for servers and processes I've been working on. So, any of those things been particularly useful that we may or may not have found because yeah. they're small and new? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, we use a couple tools from them. Heck is one of them. We use it to aggregate, aggregate a lot of logs, and instead of the typical Elk, Elastic Log Search, Kibana cluster, uh, we're using Heka in there instead, and that's been really useful for us. Additionally, their Circus thing, uh, their Circus tool, which is kind of like Supervisor D, but a little bit on steroids and a little bit more intelligent and plays nicely with Heka, is something that we use for controlling these WSGI processes. Does that answer your question? Oh, <laughs> cool. 
Um, hi. Uh, one of the things uh, you didn't talk about uh, too much was uh, DR and backup. Uh, how do you handle those? So uh, the, DR, the question is, uh, how do we handle disaster recovery and backup type situations for this? Um, and the way we do it is we have incremental uh, backups hourly through the NFS share. It's this big, scary NetApp thing. And sometimes we can just, uh, and those are for the canonical copies of the repositories. So we can wave at that and say, this is good enough. Um, additionally, we have seven copies of it on all of our web mirrors that we can use uh, if we need to use those. And from that, we also have backups that run on those hosts as well. I think we are using, uh, we're using Amanda to copy all that off. Um, what kind of storage engine are you using for hosting all these repositories? And have you done any analysis on file systems or what other system actually works better? Yeah. Um, so the question is what kind of storage systems we're using and if we think that uh, something uh, would be better than what we're currently using. Um, so right now, these are just local file systems uh, on the web mirrors, and those are just using XFS without too many tuning options on them. Um, the, the, the hosts themselves, the, the masters, are using uh, uh, basically a NetApp-backed uh, NFS mount. Uh, we have experimented with, and we might go in the direction of using uh, one of Facebook's products, which is called uh, HGSQL, and it actually keeps the repository data inside an SQL database, which is uh, good. Unfortunately for us, it doesn't really solve a lot of uh, performance problems that we've been having recently, but nonetheless, it's still a pretty cool project. Yeah, me again. Um, I was just wanted to ask um, about, uh, what's it called, uh, global replication. So obviously, Mozilla, you've got offices all around the world. Uh, and you, you, plan, uh, you mentioned, you know, with the new architecture, you, you hope to sort of, uh, you know, do data center replication so you can, you know, hopefully make it easier for, for those devs to work. Well, how are you going to solve that problem? So... Uh Back when uh, all of the hosts were just running all of the things and they all had an NFS mount and they all had read-write access to the data and everything ran on those four hosts, um, this really didn't scale to different data centers. One of the reasons we switched to doing um, local disks on the mirrors was that we would be able to throw it anywhere. Um, the system that it's using right now for that is just a little clustering system I built for myself that uh, is basically, uh, it's literally SSH in a for loop that goes through it. Um, and it maintains some persistent SSH connections, and it triggers, uh, and SSH is in with an identity that then pulls the information, and it uses local disk for the storage. So the theory was that if we wanted to have a repository, or if we wanted to have a mirror in, say, the Paris office, uh, we would be able to hand them a small machine, and it would, it, among other things, it would serve this, and then we could just add it to this list of mirrors, and then it could uh, go mirror the data over there, and then using some load balancers or some tricky uh, DNS views they would be able to pull from their server. Whoa. <laughs> okay. If there are no further questions, <laughs> I and everything's falling apart, yeah. as your talk suggests. Um, <laughs> yeah, I get to thank you. And you. I'll take both of them. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that will. <laughs>